Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss issues related to America's symphony orchestras with special guests, J.C. Barker, Executive Director of the Delaware Symphony Orchestra, Jonathan Parrish, Executive Director of the Maryland Symphony Orchestra, Sarah Weber, Executive Director of the Association of California Symphony Orchestras, and Steve Collins, Executive Director of the Hartford Symphony in Connecticut. So thank you all for joining us. This is I've been so looking forward to this because we have this group of, of symphony leaders who can enlighten us on how we bring this enlightened form of entertainment to, to more people, how we engage audiences in this new uh, world of, of electronic communications. Uh, so let me just uh, set you up because we're going to go over to you, uh, JC, in, in Delaware. The average age of the symphony audience was about 30 through the 1960s. And today it's doubled and is approaching about 60 years old. That's the average, right? And a New York uh, Times recently claimed that people younger than 40 comprise less than a quarter of the New York Phil's audience. And that audience also skews quite young with tourists and so on coming to visit New York. So we have, a, we have an age problem among other problems. Uh, so it, it begs the question, is, is the symphony experience keeping up with the time? Have we become uh, passe? JC, what do you think? What's, what's going on with our audiences? Why are we losing audiences and how do we get those audiences back into those halls? Well, I think the short answer to your question is no, uh, we are not keeping up with the times. I think that uh, for the past 10, 15 years, uh, certainly we've seen this trend and uh, we've been aware of it. There have been many studies as to how to correct it. Uh, but I think one of the interesting things about what we've just been through, and I've heard referred to many times, is that what we're dealing with now is nothing less than a cultural reckoning. And it, it really has um, at least given us the opportunity to, to face this um, head on. And uh, providing accessibility is, of course, one of the big issues. But... Uh, I think that at least in the symphony industry, uh, that we've not really listened enough. And I think that we are in a place now where we must listen. It's not a question of, um, of providing free tickets. It's not a question of sending out emails. It's not anything like that. What it is, is like, it, it's really a question of us listening to our communities and all the communities are different. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, there really is no one size fits all for this type of work that we have to do. And I know at least in Delaware that we are launching aggressively into uh, a period where we will try to collect information from our community, from all facets of our community about uh, what they want the Delaware Symphony to be. So, uh, but going back to your question, are we doing enough? No. And uh, it's a great place to start. You know, I, I, love, I love what you're saying because we're asking people to listen to symphonies. But if symphonies aren't listening to the audience, then what the, uh, the experience that, that the symphonies provide to the audience will, will uh, fall short because we're not responding we're just we're just yelling out into the crowd and saying, um, you know, take whatever we have to give. Uh, Jonathan, how do you see this this issue? Is this a matter of, of listening? And if we and if it is a matter of listening to the audience and then responding appropriately, uh, what is the Maryland Symphony doing to engage uh, those audience members who are not coming in, but who you'd like to invite into the halls? Yeah, this is a, a question we deal with uh, a great deal, each, each of us individually, and then when we come together to have uh, kind of industry-wide discussions, talking about um, the, uh, the, uh, the audience and the, the growth or lack of growth of the audience um, in, in terms of, um, of, of sort of age demographic, but other demographics as well. Um, I mean, there's a... Um, a lot of discussion, a lot of work being done now, good work being done uh, in orchestras in, uh, in the being, becoming more equitable, more diverse, more inclusive, uh, appealing to different um, 
to different parts of our community. Does that yeah. include changing the repertoire? Because, you know, basically the repertoire is, uh, uh, and mind you, that's this. I grew up with these art forms, right? The repertoire is a bunch of dead European white guys who are, while their, their music is amazingly textured, um, they come out of very similar and intersecting traditions. There's a whole other world out there. Uh, does, that, does that include, Jonathan, uh, a yeah. shift in the repertoire? It absolutely does. I mean, there's, uh, there's uh, a lot that orchestras can do. I mean, we don't want to abandon our, our canon, our, our normal uh, repertoire, but we want to make sure that uh, there's, there aren't great works by uh, composers of color that have been neglected. Uh, and that you're seeing that all over the country right now. You're seeing a renaissance of, of interest in uh, the works of Florence Price. Um, uh, African-American woman composer who um, may have come to great notoriety at, in her day, I think in like the early part of the 20th century, had she not been a woman and had she not been African-American. Uh, many orchestras now programming works by her. So sure, we're making that effort. I think one of the challenges is you can program a more diverse um, uh, selections, but if people don't know that you're doing it, or don't know why, or don't have a connection, or you have no way to communicate to the people that may care about that, uh, that's a big challenge, I think, because, you know, I think all of us know, we all have a database. Um, when we go to our database, we're sending mostly messages to people who already know us and like us. It's how do you get past that? How do you get to the new groups? So the Maryland Symphony, and, and one of the exciting things for me in, in taking this job, i year and a half ago, about three months before the pandemic began, uh, was that the, um, in the last strategic planning process here, the vision that was developed for the Maryland Symphony was music for everyone. And, and I thought that was a very exciting uh, and challenging concept. And the, uh, the organization is very committed to that. Now, are we living up to it yet? No, uh, but we're working on it. And we've done some, so made some good progress uh, towards that. So, so I'm when, when you talk about music for everyone, are, are we talking about, Sarah, getting out of the halls as well and also changing some of the agreements with uh, musicians? Because, you know, if, if, if we keep perf performing the same music, Jonathan's making a great point where you want to enrich the repertoire. You don't want to throw the, the uh, cannon under the bus, right, Jonathan? Right. You want to enrich it, but you're also making the point, Jonathan, and I'd like, uh, Sarah, because you have this great um, purview, right? It's, it's multiple orchestras throughout the state of California. How do we create a different experience? Because if the experience is the same, but we adjust the music a little bit, that's not going to solve the problem. How do, how do we deal with that? And, and what structural changes do we have to agree to with our staffs, our musicians? Do we have to change staffs? and evolve in that way as well? I think um, orchestras, one of the wonderful things that I think, the wonderful gifts of the pandemic, and I always try to look for silver linings, is that I saw orchestras throughout California and our uh, neighboring states, uh, we have members in Nevada and Arizona, really leaning into this um, sort of public service, social service role, uh, of course, in the virtual capacity, but they wanted, at all, you know, no matter what, to continue to, to provide music and connection to their communities because it was being lost because we were in isolation. They wanted to be relevant. They wanted to be of service. And I think that attitude uh, needs to expand uh, into our recovery that we're, that we're working towards that we have to, yes, get out of the concert halls, but community outreach really shouldn't just be relegated to a department or part of education. It should be baked into the DNA of everything we do and and not just outreach because that sort of implies this one-way dialogue that we were just talking about but um participation uh, listening um engagement showing up for our community when it has nothing to do with us um we just had an annual conference last week and uh, michael morgan the phenomenal longtime director of the oakland symphony said that his marker of success for oakland is when he uh, hears that people in Oakland 
hold the symphony in high regard and know that they're doing good work, even if they've never stepped foot into the concert hall, that, that the reputation of what Oakland Symphony is doing to make their community better uh, exceeds whether someone has come and, and sat in the chair and listened. And so I think holding ourselves to that marker that we are good, um, we are as essential as libraries and uh, schools and that our communities couldn't do without us. I think that's the lens and, and it might sound utopian, but I really did feel and see this during the pandemic that orchestras were going all into this identity of we're here for our communities because they need us, not we need them, they need us. And, and we want to listen to what they need and respond to it. And Steve, we just completed a poll in which we asked how often uh, do respondents uh, attend classical music performances in person. It's interesting, three or four times annually seem to be the, 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 uh, the greatest uh, a number of responses, and um, and now this is a select audience, um, but the connection to classical music still exists. In Hartford, you have a majority black city, um, and the uh, cultural institutions have not necessarily connected with that audience. Uh, the uh, the museums, the the symphonies, and so on, um, uh, have not necessarily across the United States connected with that audience. Um, how are you faring in Hartford and what kind of programs do you have? Because when you have uh, a demographic that is changing, when you have cities that are that are younger and younger and younger and our audiences are getting older and older and older, when our audiences and our performers and our staffs are, I mean, look at look at the picture here. Right. We're all we're all white. Right. How, how do you deal with this uh, operating in a in a city that is so diverse and so vivacious? How do you bring that life into the into the halls? Yeah, so great, great, great question, Mark. Um, if I may, I'd like to just backtrack just, just for a minute about the conversation thus far and just kind of point out that it, it's, it's my assumption slash observation that the, the discussion thus far about, uh, about the, 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 the repertoire, the, the music that we play and, and expanding the repertoire and all that is based on the assumption that we're talking about the classical canon, right? And well, I'd just like to point, point out for, point. for many orchestras, the Hartford Symphony Orchestra included, classical concerts are roughly half of what we do on stage. The other half of what we do is not easily categorized as classical music, right? And, and that run, runs the range of, you know, a, a, a traditional Americana concert on Fourth of July weekend to a movie concert to... Um, you know, a, a rock and roll band tribute concert, you know, all, all different kinds of things. But, you know, I want to point that out because I find for me all, all too often these conversations focus exclusively on classical concerts and ignore all the other forms of orchestral music, which I think is a shame because it doesn't it doesn't open people's eyes to the, 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 the breadth and, and variety, the depth that's so wonderful about orchestras. That's that's what keeps me interested. It's one of the things that keeps me interested in, in my job and, and the mission here, because it is so much more expansive. Than well, look at video games, look at the film industry, right? The, these classical forms with new composers. And, and if you if you just look at some of the, uh, the music that is presented, which really informs our experience of, of film in television shows, it's just right. stunning what's out there. Right, right. So, so you know, one of the, the questions, and I, I don't mean to sidestep your question about, about minority representation and, and Hartford and all that, and, and I'll get to that if I'm permitted. But, you know, what, one, one of the questions that, that this brings up is, for, for, for most orchestras, I think the relationship between the classical audience and I'll call it the non-classical audience is somewhat disconnected. Right. It, it is certainly in Hartford. I can tell you that much. And, and the question is, is there a way to bridge that gap? How much energy should we or do we spend trying to bridge that gap or do we not try to do that at all, really? And just kind of treat different kinds of concerts as different product lines and different audiences. And, and that's it. You know, well, the young people are listening to all sorts of forms. Right. I mean, if you if you look. JC, at, at your audiences in Delaware, which I'm sure, Sarah, you know, your audiences across the West or Jonathan, 
uh, Steve, right? Our young people are listening to music that is informed by, um, by music coming out of Korea and music coming out of India and, and, um, and country and Western and fusion and all these different forms, including classical forms, including very, very complex. If you listen to Radiohead, I mean, who, who can listen to that and not feel that there is a symphonic element to uh, much of their music? Um, how do we um, include uh, some of these ideas into uh, this idea of live performance and then in particular during COVID mediated the way this is? How do, how do we deal with that? Steve, I don't, I don't want to uh, interrupt because you were about to get to this. To these yeah, things. so <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try to answer that question and your previous question with one answer. It, I'll do my best. <laughs> so so I think I think one example is um, the the classical concert that is designed and programmed in a way to uh, to to bridge both of those gaps. And I'll give an example of the Hartford Symphony season opening concert this upcoming season. October 1st through 3rd. The concert is called Beethoven's Center. And guess what? It features Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, right? But it also features a piece by um, a young female Brazilian-American composer named Clarissa Saad called A Goal uh, for Orchestra and Audience Members. So um, this, this is a classic example. Orchestras have been doing this for years. This is nothing new. A, class is a classic example of, of, of a well-known piece of the repertoire combined with something that's new and relatively unknown to try to bridge some gaps and stylistic differences and all that kind of thing. But it, it's also, I think, an example of how um, it's become increasingly important for orchestras to listen to the communities in the way that we've been talking about in reaching out to the, to the Brazilian American community here in Hartford. Uh, keep in, I'm sensitive to what you said about Hartford having a large African American population, but also a very large Latino population. Um, and I do not mean to imply that all Latino populations are the same. The Brazilian American community can be very different than other Latino communities. But, um, but this is an opportunity for us to reach out to the Brazilian American community here in the Hartford area and to, to engage with them um, in a way that they, that they may not be expecting and to listen and to build those relationships and listen. So, I'd, like get, I'd like to get to the whole idea of how to present. Uh, JC, are you presenting differently uh, today than you did 15, 20 years ago, or is everything ha unfolding within the halls? Well, I, not unlike Jonathan, I arrived here. I actually signed a contract to come here on the 27th of February, 2020. Uh, the next Friday, the world shut down. And so uh, there's, there's a reason I'm telling you that, uh, in that, we, of course, had a year that we got through last year. And this year, what we're doing is still transitional. We are still moving into a different different place. Um, yes, the uh, what I found here and what has what has been the common practice here is that it's been within the hall. And it's been um, not unlike what Steve mentioned. I mean, the, the, the programming mentioning and, and mixing the programming up. Um, but I wanted to address just a couple of, of things. I had a wonderful experience the other day with a community member that's not really a musician, an orchestra person. And uh, we were talking about education and we were talking about outreach and we were talking, Sarah, about this idea of social services. And uh, we were talking about particularly education products for orchestras. And he said to me very astutely, he said, you know, it is not important that every child learn how to read the treble clef. He said, we're at a point now where really what we need to instill in all of our community is giving them an opportunity to have what he described as that chill moment, the chills, the sensation that people get when they hear live acoustic music in whatever form, uh, the canon of 20, all the old white men, whatever, all of those things. It doesn't, it, in his mind, uh, he has had experiences with classical music. He's had experiences with all of this other music that we're talking about, the video music, the movie music, everything. And uh, it's trying to attract people through creating this sense of, as he said, the chills. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really eye opening to me. And I think that looking ahead, it'll change a lot of the way that I think we'll proceed. Uh, 
there are many other things that we need to address. I mean, classical musicians live in a vacuum, have for years. It's just the way it is. Um, the way we refer to what we do, our language that we use, you know, when we look at something we list in a program as opus number 27, nobody really cares about your opus number. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I mean, these are these are really hard things. But the truth of the matter is, is that going back to what I said at the beginning, it's cultural reckoning. Um, we as orchestras, as institutions uh, should serve our entire communities and uh if we could detect anything that's serving as a barrier, we have to address it. I have no well, idea if I've answered your question, Mark, but no, I think that it's that's what point. I wanted to say. <laughs> it's a great point. This whole idea of experts becoming isolated, right, and, and right. disconnected. And we're seeing this with, with our scientists as well. And, and the result is that we have a vaccine uh, rejection by huge swaths of, of, of Americans, which, which has dire uh, consequences. Uh, Jonathan, how do we we do what JC was was pointing to? You know that that idea of of chills. I mean, for me, of course, and so many people of, of my generation shared this in two thousand one, Space Odyssey. Uh, Richard Strauss's "Also Sprach Zarathustra," the best spoke to Zarathustra. That piece of music was that moment, right? And you, you hear that in, in certain symphonies. You, you can hear it in almost any type of musical form, in, in any type of musical form. How do you bring that, that moment to people in a way that creates that connection and that provides that experience over and over again without forcing people into just one conformant experience? Because that's not what the young people want today. They don't want to be part of one conformant experience. Yeah, I think I think that's our challenge, and I think there are multiple ways to do that. We're not we're we're exploring some of those. You know uh, what you said about uh, scientists. I, my mind went right to that as well when you're we describing that. Because when I hear them talking on TV, sometimes I think, why are you using this terminology that is not. Uh, easily understood. Well, yeah, we, we're guilty of that too. But, um, you know, I think um, we talked about the different types of programming Steve mentioned that orchestras do, and maybe um, a lot of people aren't aware. I love running into people who say, well, I don't, I don't like orchestras or I don't like classical music or I don't like music because uh, I, I find that a, an easy challenge to overcome. Uh, it's very easy to challenge them with a few questions and find that actually, indeed, they do like music. And it turns out something that they like is what is something we can play. Because basically, when it comes down to it you know, with orchestras, we have a bunch of professional musicians. And if it's music, we can play it. Um, now, some of it more effective, Zarathustra. And by the way, you don't have to be able to pronounce it to enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm, a native, I'm a native German speaker, so I have no excuse. <laughs> but that's certainly one way. I mean, I think that's our that's our marquee product in the right concert hall with the right forces, with the right piece of music and the right leadership. There can be a transcendent experience. But and, and we want everybody to experience that because for us, that's that's the biggest chill moment. But uh, but there can be so many. And I. I think orchestras are a lot more like uh, car dealers. Uh, you know, car dealers have to have a luxury line. They have to have a, a midsize line. They have to have a sporting option. They've got to have an off-road option. They've got to have an economy option. Uh, everybody focuses with orchestras on sort of the luxury line. And maybe that's what we put out at the curb. Uh, to bring people in. And maybe that's what we want everybody to drive, but it's not the right model for everybody. What uh, we an interesting notion. I mean, this whole idea of, of uh, you know, let's, let, let's do a Chevy and a Cadillac, right? Let's do a Mercedes and, um, you know, a Kia, right? Um, yeah. Sarah, uh, are, are you systematically talking about these and, and trying to encourage um, orchestras across California, because how many orchestras are part of your organization? We have about 120 to 130 orchestras of all but LA Phil down to community orchestras, huge range of orchestras that we uh, serve. 
Are you encouraging people to to systematically try to create models and then share models across California for doing what Jonathan's talking about, which is to create different product lines, uh, yeah. but also uh, try to encourage uh, the, the the performers, the artists, the staffs to shift yeah. their whole educational perspective in terms of how they were brought up. Yeah, I, I'm not convinced it's the repertoire that keeps people away. I think, what, you know, people, uh, audiences are pretty sophisticated and open. And I think, you know, seeing live music performed by an org, there's nothing that replicates that. I think it's all the other things about orchestras, the culture, the is sort of insider baseball aspect to it, the lack of diversity and representation in boards and staff and musicians that that um, have made us seem uh, sort of untouchable or, or unapproachable. I think um, it, and, you know, this need to be authentic, this need to be uh, to be OK with imperfection, this need to diversify our offerings, I think is all responsiveness to our communities. But I don't I do think that expanding the repertoire is important. It, it, and I don't see it as a, a loss and getting rid of I see it as an expansion. But I think it's there's a cultural shift that is happening and needs to continue to happen to create a place where you feel like you belong at an orchestra. I, I, I think that that's, there's a barrier there that doesn't even allow you to enjoy the music. This like this uh, sense that you don't, or you have to know special things to, to go and belong. And so I just think opening the doors and, and being okay to be a little messy and not perfect um, and is going to be, uh, is, is, is going to appeal. I think that's what was great about the pandemic. You know, it was, we were messy and imperfect and, um, but we're willing to do it anyway. You know, that willingness to try and experiment and offer things that we've never done before, uh, I think is, I think is the key. I, it's, it's just such a great point. We just completed two other polls. One is uh, how often you watch or listen to classical music. So, mediated by electronic forms. And we found that uh, a total of, of, uh, of 84, 85% uh, listen at least monthly and, fav- and also listen integrated with other music. Uh, the rest, um, 14% said rarely, um, no one said never. Uh, and then if you take a look at what, uh, why our audiences are disappearing, that was really interesting. So we set up the question in, in this way. We said uh, market share for classical music has plummeted and today sounds only at about 1%. Why is the classical music audience uh, shrinking? And um, we had the, the the greatest response was changing tastes and also a uh, cultural that, that younger, more diverse audiences are no longer connected. So we know what the challenge is, right? We know what the challenge is. And part of this has got to be the experience of music. Some of it's got to be the repertoire. I want to talk um, just sort of in closing, I'd like to go around the room in terms of the training of the musicians, because you've all talked about, and JC, you made that point about, you know, sort of the opus language and, you know, nobody cares, yeah. no opus, opus uh, uh, you're, you're talking about, except the experts. But um, I, I think that there's also the issue of the rhythmic form. If you take a look at Ellington's works, they're rarely performed and they require a very sophisticated uh, orchestra, but but many orchestras, many of the musicians are not necessarily equipped. They're not versed in that form, right? If you if you're going to expand the uh, repertoire, you're going to have less than perfect performance. If it's if it's less accustomed, are we willing to go into the experimental area and make it fun, make it exciting, make imperfection okay amongst musicians and in the audience? And, and how do we do that in order to create that, that verve? Because if there is not this, this willingness to be imperfect, imperfect, we can't change, right? Because we're most perfect on the things that we, we've always done. Uh, let, let's just go around the, uh, around the room. We'll, we'll go to uh, JC, then Jonathan, and we're going to give Steve the last word. Um, uh, JC, are, are we willing to be imperfect, and can we make imperfect fun? Well, the short here again, the short answer is yes. But the other thing is that I don't ever underestimate the abilities of these musicians that we have. Um, you know, really, uh, we see them, 
because of what they've, we've been producing as organizations. But I know with the several orchestras I've worked with that the abilities and the cross genres that these musicians can cover is vast. Um, but yeah, if it's imperfect, exactly like Sarah said, I love that, that uh, if we need to be a little messy, that's fine. And who's judging here? I mean, wh who, what's our standard? I think it's the effort really that, that we're talking about. And, um, but I have high confidence that, you know, in, in these people that we, we work with, these people, the musicians. Um, Maybe part of, part of the issue is in our hiring. Let's, let's bring people in who have the uh, instrumental ability, um, but might bring a different verb, a different, a different um, um, you know, way of approach, of attacking the music, and then create that dialogue amongst the various musicians. Uh, Jonathan, what's your answer to this complicated Well, I, I, I totally agree with JC in, in, in that you should not underestimate um, our musicians. I think um, the pandemic showed that there's great creativity, there's great commitment to this art form, form, form and there's a, a great deal of, of maybe unrealized talent, talent that at least our, we as organizations were not taking advantage of. Think back to um, April and May when concerts were being canceled, but musicians still wanted to perform and some amazing videos were put together online. These acapella videos, which took extraordinary, um, you know, technical abilities um, and, and, and playing abilities and recording abilities to put together and make effective. And, and I would say, you know, the vast majority of those were put together entirely by musicians. Did any of uh, the executive directors here um, organize one of those from scratch and assign musicians to that? I mean, that, that's a, that's a harder way to do it, you know, to sort of top down that kind of a project. Um, musicians just uh, grassroots created these um, these wonderful videos that uh, that presented the art form. But you're making a, a wonderful point. The idea of if we're going to have a Chevy and a Cadillac and a Mercedes and all these different different types of products lines, right? You have to get the ideas coming in from wherever they wherever the idea emerges, right? And you, you give, you empower people, you make it fun. Uh, Sarah, um, what are you doing to encourage that kind of thinking and to redeploy models that might work at one orchestra in a different one? I'll say two quick things because I know we're running out of time. But uh, one, I don't think you have to sacrifice artistic excellence to innovate. You can have both and, and uh you know, Jonathan, and it was absolutely right in his example. And the second uh, thing that just popped into my head is this concept of democratization of leadership, which we saw all over the place during the pandemic. No one knew what to do. No one knew what the right answer was. So every good answer was allowed to be on the table and maybe breaking down the, you know, orchestras are pretty hierarchical, hierarchical and that you know, sort of had to go away during the pandemic and all sorts of great ideas came forward. And we talk a lot about that, that um, maybe making space for new voices is really the way forward. And uh, Steve, we'll give you the last word. What's your answer to this uh, complicated problem? And what are, what are you going to do tomorrow or today to enact your own answer? You know, I agree with all with everything that that my fellow panelists have said in the last uh, few minutes here. I love what you said, uh, Mark, about uh, maybe rethinking the way that we hire musicians and that what the job entails, what's expected, what's valuable. Um, I will point out that I'll call it the the new generation of of classical musician. I think is expecting a very different career than the previous generation did. And that's something that we need to take it, it, that we need to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. This plays right into all the conversations we've been having for the last half hour. And I think that orchestras need to do a much better job of capitalizing on that opportunity. It means changing the way that we hire musicians and, and taking a really thoughtful look at the job description. What is it, who, who do we want in our orchestra? Not just the man or woman who plays a certain excerpt or solo better than the, the person before them. It has to go deeper than that. 
So let's take a look at that and think about how we're hiring people around that. What we're doing here in Hartford is we just formed, this sounds like a very formal answer, but we just formed an audition procedures committee. Not to look at what time should we hold auditions, but to look at, in part, this very concept of who are we hiring? What, what do we want from them? And how do we make sure we have an audition and, and hiring process that gets to that goal? You know, the, the thing that strikes me about every answer here is that if you look at this sector, the sector is where the sector is, right? It's comprised of, of the people who comprise the sector. It is what it is, but it doesn't have to remain that way. And the thing that I really admire about, about all of you and your people, your musicians, your boards, your staffs, your audiences, is that there is, is such an understanding of how you keep music vital. And it, you keep music vital not by repetition, but by experimentation, right? By new experiences, by new ways of doing things, by new staff. Steve, what you've what you said in terms of, you know, how do how do you hire a musician? What is the standard of perfection? You know, there's that old saw that if you if you don't blow a, a, a false note every once in a while, you're just not trying hard enough. Right? So so you know how how do we go forward? We go forward by doing things differently, you know, trying eight times, maybe falling down seven, but getting up, trying that eighth time and then doing it a ninth time. Thank you so much. It's been such a great, great discussion uh, with you all. J.C. Barker, uh, Executive Director of the Delaware Symphony Orchestra. Jonathan Parrish, Executive Director of the Maryland Symphony Orchestra. Sarah Weber, Executive Director of the Association of California Symphony Orchestras. And Steve Collins, Executive Director of the Hartford Symphony in Connecticut. Uh, thank you so much. Please thank your staffs, your, uh, your donors, your musicians, your wonderful, wonderful people. And, and let's keep going. Let's make the change that we need to have. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.